Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, I'm a health economist at uh, Nice, and I work on the asthma guideline for which we develop a diagnostic model. And uh, for reason you will see, it's a model developed in R, which is not usually the the software we use. So there was a lot to learn and a lot a lot of advantages and challenges that I would like to share with you today. So um, very briefly, what are the issue with diagnostic asthma? So asthma is a very <laughs> Uh, widely diagnosed diseases in the UK and all around the world, but uh, it's known to be overdiagnosed. And the reason for that is that there is no gold standard test. So every physician, in order to, to reach a diagnosis, need to give to, to, the, to the patients like a lot, a combination of different tests. And that's the point, that, that's the difficulty of building a model because the model needs to have like a diagnostic pathway where you give some tests and then you, you retest some people, et cetera, et cetera. In 2017, NICE uh, published a recommendation um, where a diagnostic algorithm was, uh, was recommended. And this came from a cost-effective analysis that was done at that time. However, uh, it was reported that, uh, that this was poorly, poorly implemented, mostly because that the recommendation that the algorithm was found to be a little bit too rigid, uh, not really flexible, and there were some tests recommending that this algorithm that were not available, and therefore uh, uh, it, it was poorly um, implemented. Therefore, for the update that we did, um, which is currently in consultation, uh, we try to make an economic analysis that could somehow be more, uh, could, could find algorithms that were somehow, uh, that were somehow more flexible and easy to implement. And that's one of the reasons we chose to use R. Uh, there, there are two main reasons actually we used to choose R. One is um, technical and the other is more about structure. So the first one is the issue of conditional dependency, uh, which is uh, basically the fact that the test uh, they, they represent the correlation between test results and the fact, uh, represent the fact that some tests will agree with each other and therefore will not be very useful to be given to the same person. Um, so just to show what's um, a conditional dependency with this example about punctuality in the office, like the probability um, me being late in the office uh, could be seen as independent as a my colleague Dave being late in the office. So if you see that I'm late, that if you consider this to be independent, you should uh, assume you should uh, you, you should uh, uh, not use this information to deduct the probability that Dave is independent. Dave is late. However, if we both commute by train, and if there is a train strike, then suddenly these probabilities, these events are not independent anymore because if I'm late, could be because of train strike, in that case, you will know that they will be late as well. So the probability will change, the condition uh, probability that they is late will change. And the same works for, uh, for test of asthma, if we have, or for any other kind of disease. If you have two tests, you could consider them to be independent, but if they both uh, measure a particular phenomenon, for instance, lung inflammation, which is uh, correlated with asthma, if this phenomenon is also affected by uh, things other than asthma, like for instance, COPD, aller uh, seasonal aller allergy, etc., etc., then uh, these two events will not be uh, independent anymore. And uh, by contrast, if we have another test that measures something else that is correlated with asthma, but not with the uh, confounding factors that I mentioned before, then it would be more likely that it would be more likely that this test is independent and therefore more useful to be given in a sequence. Um, in the, there, there, are, there is some literature on conditional dependency, and usually it's found that not taking into account that will lead to erroneous uh, results. There are two main ways to, in, to incorporate conditional dependencies in a model. Uh, the first one, which is the simplest and will not require a statistical software like R, uh, requires though very granular data. It needs uh, individual patient data uh, and is less flexible than the second uh, method. So basically you will need to have like a table like that where you have all the patients and all the patients need to receive all the tests included in the model, which again is very rare to find uh, a data like that. Mm -hmm. And then in order to calculate uh, the joint accuracy, Alfred, you... Sorry, I'll show you a screen. Are you sharing your screen? It yeah. seems that you're not. Yeah. 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 Okay, okay. Am I? Okay. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> I thought I had to, to start from the beginning again. <laughs> so uh, basically, the first matter... <laughs> The first method is to um, requires this granular data. So you will need to have uh, basically a table like that where you have all the tests and all the patients and all the patients need to receive the test and you need to have information also whether they have asthma or not. And the way you can calculate joint accuracy here 
it's basically each step. Uh, for instance, this is a, an, an example for a diagnostic strategy where you give test one to everybody and then test two only for, to those who test negative. So you, 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 you just consider the beginning uh, those uh, who receive test one, which are everybody, and you calculate the sensitivity and specificity here. And then in the second step, you just look at the patient that will be retested. In this case, there will be uh, those who were tested <laughs> negative uh, uh, at the previous step. And therefore, step by step, you can you can calculate the final joint accuracy that will take into account the, all the pathway. So this is the best method if you have the data. But again, uh, the data is not always available. Uh, the methods that uh, does not require the data, and that's the, the one we use for the children diagnostic model, for instance, requires a statistic, a statistical software like R. And uh, what is a basically a micro simulation micro simulation uh, method through the multivariate probit model. So basically, if you have uh, two information that are needed for the probit, which is the sensitivity specificity of each test that, for instance, we can we could recover from the literature review, and uh, some information on the correlation between tests that could come from expert opinions or from other studies. In this case, in this case, in this specific case, we had a study. Then you can use um, you can fed these two information into a multivariate probit that will generate serial <coughs> IPD results, so simulated results, not real results. That will though be very uh, that will still be useful to, to calculate joint accuracy because they will reflect the sensitivity and specificity and correlation that uh, is observed from from studies. So this 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 of course this system uh, needed uh, software like R and uh, that's why we, we use it. The second reason we use R was uh, a structural reason. It's related with the fact that you wanted, as I said at the beginning, to make a model that could be flexible in the choice of the, of the, of the strategies. And um, this became clear at a certain point because whereas for the previous guy, um, update on, I, uh, on, on asthma, uh, a set of six diagnostic strategies were identified at the beginning, in this case, the committee and the, the uh, members of the committee were not uh, sure about what what strategy they wanted from the beginning. They want us to test different strategies to change their mind if possible. And the problem with that is that when you build a diagnostic pathways, you have really a lot of permutation because you can, for instance, switch all the position of the test, or you can even combine some tests in a single step, which could have economic advantage, for instance. So the kind we had like uh, nine tests for adults and nine for children, so the kind of permutation uh, are, are a lot. Um, that's why um, we, we decided to use Shiny. And by using Shiny, uh, we built a model that was very easy to change and it was very easy to, uh, where the strategy could be changed all the time. It could be actually used by the committee, which is something that we don't do often. And I'm gonna try to share very briefly my screen to show how uh, the model looks like. So um, this is the, the shiny code, and if I run the app, um, so this is this are general information about the model. These uh, are, are now published for the for the stakeholders for consultation, so they are useful for people who will review the model for during the consultation. If we go to the actual model, what I wanted to sh to show you is the way there are there are ten strategies that are uh, the base case scenario. But uh, what we did in order to enhance the committee uh, engagement was to uh, create something like that. Uh, which is basically a tool for you to create your own diagnostic strategy. So here, for instance, you see all the step of a potential diagnostic algorithm, and then on each step you decide uh, which kind of test you want uh, people to receive. For instance, I can say that I want to give BDR as the first test, and then retest with uh, Fino, those who are negative to BDR, and then I can save this, and then another strategy could be that I want to I don't know, just test with BDR and then give metacolin after that. But of course, uh, we test a different strategy and we um, 
uh, we did it with the help with the committee. So we, 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 we achieve a, a very important engagement level. And then you run the model and then you will receive, uh, this will show the results. Um, in a second so then you will see like the strategy you selected the two that we defined before and then of course you will have uh, all the results in terms of cost effectiveness accuracy etc etc okay i'm gonna go back to the slide now okay so uh of course uh, we encounter some challenges, and I, I, I uh, classify this challenge in two categories. The first is what I call the, self, uh, uh, the, the limits of self-learning. And this is because we are all economists by training, and we, don't, we haven't used R uh, uh, extensively before, definitely not to build a, a complex model like that. So we found issue, particularly in the fact that we couldn't receive much feedback during the developing. Uh, we, we, we encounter, I encounter personally technical thresholds, so the uh, things that I struggle uh, alone to make, for instance, the shiny uh, interface, and I, has, I have to ask for help, and also uh, code inefficient coding uh, that could make actually the QA more difficult. And in terms of way to, um, uh, to, to address this, uh, definitely advance the training, not just on uh, how to use, uh, how, how to generally use R, but also to, gen to use specific packages that are very useful. I would say Shiny should be always used now in, uh, in models that need to be uh, reviewed by stakeholders, for instance. And definitely more engagement with the academia and, and, uh, and more opportunity for us to get feedback like this one. And the second uh, issue, we, that was the second challenge that we, we, we um, uh, we encountered was the QA first because uh, we don't have a standard template yet, we don't have an internal protocol for, for a QA model in R, and also some codes were inefficient. And again, the kind of solution that I, I identify here will be to develop an internal template for macro model in R with Shiny, which is something I'm, I'm working at the moment, and then develop an internal model for QA. Uh, so in conclusion, we found that despite the challenges we met, uh, this model has two main advantages. The use of R allow us to make very complex but very useful ana um, analysis on conditional dependency. And also the use of Shiny interface allowed us to engage with the commit in a way that we haven't never done before because we really could like uh, ask members of the committee to play with the model and to try the strategy they wanted. The guidance is currently in, uh, in consultation, so all the results uh, for the information are, in, uh, are subject to embargo but will be published hopefully by the end of the year. Uh, however, we can say that um, uh, that the use of Shiny uh, made so that a uh, strategy that probably we couldn't have told uh, uh, before uh, developing the model were actually in the final report. So I would say that the use of Shiny and the more engagement we have uh, with, with, uh, with the committee made us identify uh, potentially cost-effective strategies that we, we hadn't uh, imagined when we started developing of the model. And um, yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Alfredo. Any questions for Alfredo? Yeah, go ahead. I've definitely been there with the spaghetti code. <laughs> I feel your pain. Um, what do you think would help with that? Uh, so the, the, so the, the, the question is, uh, about uh, uh, the, the code being quite long and, and spaghetti, as, as Alfredo put it. So how, how <laughs> did uh, Alfredo um, dealt with that issue? So I think it's inevitable the first time you develop a model because you don't really have, I guess, a structure in mind. I found, for instance, now that I'm developing the template, I, I, I achieved to cut a lot of what I did before. So already my, my next, my, my, my uh, current project is much better from the point of view. I will say experience and, and feedback. We, we, we got the model reviewed by University of Bristol and we received a lot of very useful feedback there. Uh, the problem at the moment maybe is that at nice we don't have, at least in the health economics team, a lot of people that use R, so it's, uh, the feedback there <coughs> is much less, but that's why I, I, I'm encouraging now to seek more uh, engagement with the academia and seek more f opportunity to seek feedback, I guess. 
Any more questions or comments? Uh, so it's nice to meet you, Alfredo, and friends in Boston. Yes. Well. <laughs> but my question is on um, the Shiny side. What was the response to manipulating Shiny thoughtful mm -hmm. menus and sort of in Excel, they like it because you can copy and paste um, strategies into it and then quickly run it, whereas this, you would need to put it quite a lot of memories to run those strategies? Yeah, I mean, usually when we develop a, a model in Excel, it's really hard to make the committee engage with the model. Like sometimes we do share the model with, uh, with, with some members of the committee, like for instance, those that are more involved in the developing of the model. But most of the time their engagement is theoretical or for instance, like they, they recommend a structure to follow, they recommend uh, parameters that we need to use. It's rare that they have like an actual, uh, in, they, 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 they give actual inputs in the model or they use the model. Uh, I would say with Shine it was much easier because they found uh, an interface that was much easier to understand. Uh, uh, they didn't really necessarily understand the model itself, which again, uh, it, it could be an issue because R could be harder for instance to interpret than Excel in some cases. But in terms of the engagement, they were very enthusiastic. Uh, they, 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 they tried to use it. They, they found that the results they were getting made sense from the, from, from the clinical experience and that probably increased in their level of confidence that the model was telling uh, sensible stuff and uh, helped them, them to advocate for the model results during the committee meeting. Any more questions for, for Alfredo? Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, but sorry, expecting <laughs> to you. How, how nice is set up um, to host Shiny apps? Are you hosting on, on a nicer server, or do you be hosting kind of a, a, a prototype just on Shiny apps? Yeah, that's a bit of a problem because we have an internal server we can host Shiny up. But uh, for instance, what I wanted to do for consultation was to host this externally so that, for instance, people can can access that externally. But we have issue with confidentiality. Like for instance, we do have confidential data here. We couldn't host in any server that was outside NICE. And of course, server within NICE cannot be shared to the stakeholders. So uh, yeah, this is something we need to figure out. At the moment, this is uh, this is was shared to the stakeholders as a, as a batch file that you open, like an executable and open the model. Uh, but of course, yeah, it would be more, uh, more efficient if we could put on a server, but at the moment this looks risky for confidentiality. Brilliant. Thank you. Let's thank, thank you again, much. Alfredo, for thank you. your work on this presentation.